Welcome to DevWorld. It's Monday morning. Hopefully you're all awake. Um, topic this morning is blissful build pipelines. A little bit of a strange thing. So let's break it down and look at why, why I chose that title. First, blissful. Extremely happy, full of joy. An example being a blissful couple holding a baby. What is a build? A product that has been compiled from source code. So this is my own definition. The other one was the dictionary app. What is a pipeline? The process by which the product goes from source code to app store. Now, that can all sound a little bit daunting, particularly the blissful part. Most of us who have been around for a few years probably know all of the pitfalls, all of the struggles and pain that comes with doing build and tooling and making sure it all works. So let's look at Blissful and take some inspiration from Ruby. So Ruby was first developed by Matsumoto Yukihiro and he has this saying, Programmers often feel joy when they can concentrate on the creative side of programming. So Ruby is designed to make programmers happy. This is a really good thing to follow. As devs, we all know that when things work, we're extremely happy. When they don't work, we just get rather annoyed. How this then plays out in the Ruby community is the saying, Matt is nice and so we are nice. The reason I included this here is build tooling, doing a good build pipeline, making sure everything is up and going and working is something we shouldn't be hating. It's something we should be loving and enjoying. So let's have a bit of a history lesson and talk about the past. Good saying by George Santayana is, those who can't rem remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So, with that in mind, let's have a look at Hudson. Who here has used Hudson? Yep, a few of you, that's good. Hudson was developed in part by Kosuke Kawaguchi at Sun Microsystems. Sun then got brought by Oracle, and at that time, the project was forked into our lovely friend Jenkins. Who here uses Jenkins? Yay, a few more hands. They're one and the same thing, in that Jenkins is the continued development work of Hudson. There is a lot of contention about um, which is the fork and which is the continuation, um, pretty much Hudson being under the uh, guidance of Oracle is the fork because it's big corporate and we all know where that goes. Um, so Jenkins seems to be the de facto popular choice, been around forever. And my guess is over time someone has read an article on the internet that said, this is how you get Jenkins set up to handle your iOS builds. That article, is, I think I first saw that sort of article around 2009, 2010. Um, and for the time, it was actually pretty good. But should we be using Jenkins? No. <laughs> Why not? First big issue is bloat. Like any Java app, it takes pretty much half a gig just to get up and going, and that's half a gig that isn't devoted to the resources of running your build pipeline and making sure your environment is up and going. Particularly if you are doing this thing of having a Mac Mini with, say, two or three VMs on it, those VMs each probably only have maybe four gig worth of RAM associated with it, if that, and 500 meg out of that is a fair chunk. So bloat is a good reason not to use Jenkins. 
hard to configure. So, as I mentioned before, there's the common article which everyone refers to. This article is probably just a magic formula for most people. They wouldn't actually know how to configure Jenkins outside of this. Another one, we're iOS developers. We love pretty shiny things and Jenkins is just ugly. Jenkins is designed for running web applications, not iOS builds. You can run it on OS X, but realistically it's designed to run on a Linux um, server rather than an OS X desktop. And it doesn't really handle the simulator and Xcode tooling that well. Is there a better solution? Well, as you probably have guessed, yes, there is a better solution. But first, let's understand the problem a bit more. Creating a pipeline. Now, pipeline is a slightly ambiguous, can be defined as you like a term, but I, I think it's worthwhile having some very good common elements throughout it. So let's have a look at what they are. Now, when you first try and define a build pipeline, my suggestion is take baby steps. Don't sort of try and get everything going in the one, one lot. Just have it so it does one thing. When you're confident that it does that one thing well, you can move on. Not everything is automated. So CI is often considered an automated process, but for pipelining and actually getting a build from source code through to App Store, I feel that the whole process really starts back at, in Xcode, really, and what you're doing there. So just remember, it's all inclusive, not just a single part. Confidence in a process. Who here has just sort of looked at the result of Jenkins or Travis or something like that and gone, oh, I know what that failure is, I'll just rebuild it? Yep, most people that are honest would say that. And that's really a bad, bad practice to do. You should only have failures come through that you know are failures rather than going, oh, Xcode has crashed, the simulator failed to start, what can we do about it apart from hit rerun? Those things, your build pipeline, your process, really shouldn't be, shouldn't be handling. Another thing, constant iteration. You're going to always be thinking of new practices, new ideas, new things to plug in. So don't sort of set, set it up once and then forget about it. Keep returning to it. Keep making sure that it is all up and going. <laughs> this is a big thing. Don't get in the way of development. As, as we all know, we like to write code and we hate processes that slow us down. If we have to do a manual step, if we have to jump through hoops, it just becomes tedious and we end up not being happy developers. So, introduction stuff out of the way. Let's have a look at some common things that exist on your development environment. First is compiler. So Xcode, yay, awesome. Xcode has some form of static an analysis that is part of it. You can also then do things like linting, which is making sure that the code format is all there, and also look at doing code coverage either via an external tool or as part of Xcode 7. Another big thing, unit tests. Who here writes unit tests? Yay, that's good. There are a lot of talks today and tomorrow about unit testing and best practices. Do go and see them. They will be a lot of fun. They'll teach you heaps. 
I could easily rant a lot about unit testing, but it's covered elsewhere, so I won't. <laughs> UI testing. This is, this is always a contentious thing. Um, those that are Melbourne people, if you remember back a couple of, or to the start of the year, I ranted about unit testing, and I said, should you do integration testing? No. And I use the octopus as the GIF in response to that. So it was a strong no. Um, one of the reasons about that is the tooling around all of that was very broken. Um, so you had KIF, you had other things like, I think, Calabash or something like that, which pretty much used UI automation to flesh it all out. Apple has since come along and said, hey, here's UI testing as part of XC test. It is great, it is awesome, and it's pretty much working as part of Xcode. It still has a lot of rough edges, but I think this is actually something good, particularly with being able to record things, not having to deal with JavaScript. You've actually slightly abstracted in front of it by having it as part of your test bundles. So if you're using XA test, you run it there. If you're using Quick, or you run it there. If you're using Kiwi, you can use it within there. This is something great, and I'll have to eat my words from previously this year, and I'll actually say do use UI testing. One of the benefits it gives you is that you can then get snapshots. So as it goes and runs tests, you will end up with a whole heap of files like this, which are screenshots of different state. These can then be used to verify it um, and make sure that everything is in place. And it's pretty good. I like it. Code coverage. Who here would say that their code coverage is anywhere near reasonable or decent? Yeah, a couple of hesitant hands. <coughs> code coverage is always something contentious. Um, a lot of people, particularly in web, say you have to have 100% code coverage. What they mean is that every line of code has to be tested. Is that going to be well tested is always debatable. Just because you're actually it going through a particular line of code does not mean that the code itself is properly tested. You may not have been going around the boundary issues. You may have just been going, OK, here's a value. I'll throw it at. Yay, it covers the line. Good, move on. That's the bad way of doing um, code coverage. And I've sort of gone in a bit of a tangent and started ranting about testing. So back on to the tooling. Now, there are different ways of sort of getting this code coverage out. A really good one which you should all start using is Xcode 7 because it gives you this. This is from one of my apps. As you see, the common framework there. Duplication is because of a watch kit, watch OS target. Um, so yeah, that's just showing from within Xcode how all of this makes sense. How do you get it within Xcode? You just need to select a tick box, which is gather coverage data. This is part of your uh, schemes. So you select your scheme, you go down to manage it, and select test. There you have gather co coverage data. Are there other options? Yes because code coverage has been around for a long time. A lot of people use GCOV and a simple wrapper around it called GCOVER, which is really nice. Another new one is Slather. So this is from the guys at Venmo, and it does a very similar thing to GCOVER in that it looks at 
your coverage reports and prints them out nicely. The good thing is there are pending pull requests on Slather to get analysis of your Xcode 7 output, which is really awesome, and I hope it gets merged in soon. Another one is coveralls. This is a web-based service. This service allows you to just post your coverage data up somewhere. If it's an open source project, it's free. If it's a private repo, you need to pay for it, but it's actually fairly reasonably priced. Um, I haven't quite made the jump across to using it yet, but if you're working in a team, I would suggest you do. Linders. Um, so two common ones, OC Lint and Swift Lint, which are pretty good. Um, Swift Lint is one of the ones that I know supports Swift. OC Lint, a bit older, has a few issues with uh, more modern Objective C, particularly nullability. If anyone has a good solution to that, I would like to hear it. Um, but, yeah, reason why linters are good is it gives you an automated way of adhering to style guidelines. Now, everyone has a preference about a style guideline, which is really, really good. You should always have your code in a common way or common format so that people are able to look at it and understand it without going oh, this stuff is out of alignment and what not. Um, whatever code format or styling you choose, make sure it is consistent. And the linter will give you this. Another big one is version control. Who here uses some form of version control? Yay, good. Who here likes using it? Good, same group of hands. Pretty much the de facto these days is Git. And you've got a couple of options. You've got GitHub, you've got Bitbucket, and you've got GitLab. I would always recommend GitHub. It is the best integration as far as workflow goes. Um, Bitbucket's also good. People tend to go if they're cheap and they want free private repos. GitLab is more of a host-it-yourself solution, but again, pretty good, nice UI. One of the main things to remember is always do pull requests. You may have encountered people that will always push to master. There are a lot of big organisations that do it. I would definitely recommend against it. The um, reason I say that is it really provides you with a um, safety check before everything goes in. So one of the things you get if you have a well-defined um, build pipeline and CI setup is you can post responses back to, say in this case, GitHub, which will tell you whether your checks have passed. So all of your tests... Do they work? Are they, is there something in there that will start to break other things? This way, when someone comes along to review your pull request, you're able to see whether it's passed, failed, stuff like that. Make sure you have a solid workflow. Um, this is a really good point in that you need to be certain that you're doing the same things, knowing that you're getting the same sort of behaviour and result. Make sure that everything has tests run against it. Eve, like, quite often people go, oh, I'm just running my automated tests and pipeline against master or against develop or whatever branch of choice. Really, you should be running it against everything. Um, Hardware is cheap. Processing time is cheap. What costs you money is when things fail and things break. So always be running your tests against every branch. 
make sure your tests pass before merge. If you're wanting to merge something in and it has failing tests, go back and fix up the tests. Spend the time to make sure that it's going to be right and okay. So, I've covered a lot of sort of the different elements that are involved in build pipelines, covered some of the good things. So let's have a look at some of the tooling you can use. One of, one of the best bits of tooling that has recently appeared is Fastlane. What is Fastlane? Well, it provides a friendly DSL. So instead of having to have a whole heap of shell scripts that then run esoteric Xcode build commands, you can define it in a much simpler language and still understand what is going on. Fastlane is also just Ruby code. So even though it's looking like something a little bit different, it's just Ruby. You're calling methods and you're passing in data. It's really, really easy to understand, so let's have a look at an example. This is one from one of my projects. Here I'm just saying run the test, passing it in a scheme, a destination. I'm saying provide, um, do a custom derived data path and also saying clean at the end. At, once that is all run, this is the friendly output I get. So I've got the steps there and the time it took, which is pretty cool, nice and quick. Now one of the benefits of doing a sort of descriptive language rather than a bunch of checkboxes is that it actually forces you to understand what's going on under the hood. There's less chance that you'll actually sort of miss a checkbox in a UI versus running something in the text editor. Another good tool that I use is BuildKite. Now BuildKite is a CI service. It allows you to have a linear flow from start to end. It also allows you to have concurrent tests. Now there's this idea of a waiter as well. So if you've got a bunch of concurrent tests, you can also have something in there which says wait for everything to pass. If it's all passed, you're able to move it on to the next step. Okay, so what does my setup then look like? First thing is fast lane test. So this is what I do for um, every, every commit, every pull request. When it goes up to GitHub, it will have this run against it. So what happens is it runs the test and lets me know if it's passed or failed. Obviously, as part of my standard dev process, I'm constantly running the tests as well. So there's a fair bit of certainty that all of this does pass. Another one is Slather. So Slather will extract the coverage data out from the derived data path. Now, if you're looking at Slather today, maybe or maybe not the pull request to enable this has gone through. Hopefully it will at some stage, but you can always just check out the relevant project on GitHub and start using it. Um, another, next step is Fastlane Beta. So this is for pushing everything up to test flight. First thing I do is I will run the tests there. So one sort of builds upon the other in that everything like running the tests and doing slather is also done when I do a beta release. So I bump the build number. One of the things I got caught with in 
setting up Fastlane for the first time is I had already, say, had a build number of like 20 or 25 that I needed to make sure would automatically increment. Now, it looks at your info, it will increment everything in your info.plist, but it will also look at a particular variable in your project, which I think is the project build number off the top of my head, but I can't quite remember, I can look it up later. And that's the one that it uses as its reference. So if you're implementing this and you see that, oh, it's given it a build number of two rather than 42, that's probably why. You've got a mismatch from your info p list and what's in your project file. Now, after it's bumped the version number, it'll push, it'll do a commit and push it all up to Git. It'll then do a release, release on GitHub. Now, this is a really good thing in that it'll tell GitHub to put a tag against the particular commit. And if you look in GitHub, you'll see a releases um, section there and it'll create a re new release under that. So it'll provide you with a zip you can download if you want to get all of the um, files at that particular point in time. And as long as all of that is done, it'll then push it up to test flight beta. Again, a gotcha with test flight beta and this set of tooling is if your password has a special character in it, like a parentheses or a dollar sign or something like that, which is actually fairly common, this tool will fail. Um, this is actually an Apple bug in that it uses the iTunes, um, iTunes Connect uploader, which exists under the developer tools, so Xcode, and when that's run from the command line, it will not work with special characters. So one of the things you'll have to realise after spending many hours past midnight is that you need to change your password and it will all work. Again, App Store is very... Uh, much the same in that you first bump your version number. So instead of your build number, this will bump, say, the minor or the release or the major version to what you want. Um, another tool that is part of this is Snapshot. So Snapshot, well, everyone knows that in iTunes Connect you need um, images from your app. Snapshot is a part of the Fastlane tools to provide you with um, an easy way of taking that device snapshot, resizing it, putting a nice background on it, putting text on it, doing all of the fancy stuff, which is really good. Um, if you look on the GitHub page for Snapshot, which is part of Fastlane, you will see that they're planning to update it with Xcode 7. That hasn't quite happened yet. And then the last thing you do is push to App Store. Now, as part of the App Store push, you can define all of your metadata as well, such as the app description and other stuff like that. And that's really cool. How does all of this look in BuildKite? Well, you've got your build and test, which is passed in this case, it's nice and green. You've then got a unlock step or a wait step. This pretty much provides you with an option of just pausing there and having a manual release step in there. So once it's got to a particular point, you can say, yep, I'm confident with it, I'll just progress it on manually. And again, the same for the App Store. Um, so, got a bit of time. Um, 
do we have any questions about what I've covered so far? Yep. So I've been looking at Vaseline a little lately, I haven't used it yet in a commercial app. Um, yep. Interesting yourself or anyone else in the room has looked at it around the other tools, so like Sci, Jim, Pem, and all those. It's got a whole manner of abstractions and, and tools that manage your provision profiles, your APNS certificates, your Pem files, all that kind of stuff that often causes a bit of headache. Yep. Uh, Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep. So it's Fastlane. Um, question was around um, with Fastlane, it includes a whole heap of different um, tools for re signing, managing device profiles, and stuff like that. Who within the room has used it, and what has been their experience? Um, one of the responses was that the view Psi, which is the code signing part of it. Um, now, I'm going to have to ask a question of you, Sam. Yep. With your, uh, what you're doing with Psi, is it just doing an iOS app or does it have, say, a Today widget or a watch component? Just the iOS app. Just the iOS app, yeah, okay. So, one of the unsolved questions for me and for others is how does a tool such as Psy actually handle, say, your Today widgets and your watch apps, which actually have different provisioning profiles and signing? I haven't quite got a good solution to that. Yep, so a response from the audience was you can supply parameter names to it. Hopefully that solves it. I haven't quite gotten to that stage, but yep, do try it out, see how it goes. Do you, or have you used things like Diplo and GitHub Flow as part of this process as well as managing the code coming down before it's to, as it gets to the... Um, Yep, yep. So the question was, have I used either Git flow or GitHub flow to manage part of this um, development process? So I'll probably go back a couple of slides. Um, to this one, make sure you have a solid workflow. Now, with Git flow and GitHub flow, there are two different ways of actually achieving the same thing, which is doing a branch off to make sure that you have a space where you can work, doing your work on it, and then getting your work back in. Um, personally, I'm a fan of Git flow, but I use a slightly modified variant of it. A lot of people say you must have release branches, you must have feature branches, hotfix, and pretty much try and legalise it. I don't think that's the best way. Really, it comes down to make sure you do branching, make sure you have a common naming scheme, and as long as it works, it's good. Just don't always be pushing to master. Does that sort of address your question? Cool. I think it's really good. Yeah, I use it. It's more the integration. Yeah, yeah. So, um, again, make sure everything has tests run against it. So, your feature branches, your release branches, your hotfix branches, whenever they hit GitHub, Bitbucket, or whatever, make sure it runs your tests. Make sure the tests pass as well, which is a really, really important thing. Yep. So I use Jenkins as my CI. I haven't really used the build car yet. Mm -hmm. uh, after the push in, it's code server. If you've got any experience with that, or again, anyone in the room has experience with that, they're pushing to the configuration server. Um, so 
have I had any experience with Xcode server? Or? Um, so, have I had any experience with Xcode server to run continuous integration? I assume you're talking about the bots functionality as part of Xcode, is that correct? Yep. Um, from, I haven't personally done bots specifically as part, um, so everything I say in response to it is probably circumstantial in that I've heard it doesn't actually handle um, more complex project setups too well. So say you've got CocoaPods in there or Carthage in there or say you're using Git submodules, you're going to be running into problems. It's designed for everything to be there in the one directory. Um, having said that, there are probably people that really love it and enjoy using it. I haven't had that experience. We'll probably also um, explain a bit about how BuildKite does its particular agent setup in that it has a very small and lightweight um, agent written in Go, so Golang, and that is just a runner around a series of shell scripts that you write yourself. So all of your definitions within BuildKite have a command that you set up to run within um, a shell, and that's what runs your test. So one of the real benefits of this is if you're, say, a one-person shop, you can actually have your build server running on your development machine. It will run the Go agent there nicely and keep doing things in an automated way. As soon as you sort of hit issues or start growing in size, definitely, even if it's, say, a, an old MacBook Pro or something like that, take the agent off your dev machine, put it onto a separate machine that is dedicated for CI. A lot of people think it's great to have VMs for running CI servers for iOS projects. I would strongly advise against it, mainly because of performance issues. So compiling an iOS app is very disk-intensive and you'll have issues there. There's a great article from the guys at Square over in the San Francisco and they spell out the issues they've had with um, a CI setup that runs on Mac minis which run Fusion or something like that which run <coughs> further instances of OS X. So, OS 10, real, even though you can run it in a virtualized environment, isn't designed to be run in a virtualized environment. So just have dedicated hardware. As I've said before, hardware is cheap. If you're serious about CI, just buy more Mac Minis. One Mac Mini runs one agent and you're good to go. The limitation, unfortunately, with one agent per box is actually a limitation with the simulator where you can only have one instance of the iOS simulator running at a time. Yep, cool. Any more questions? Yep. Yep. Um, so the question was, since I've had a um, slide which said make sure everything is tested, does that extend to the build pipeline itself? Now, this is the um, simplest way to answer this is, okay, say you do write some tests that test your build pipeline. Do you then write tests that test your tests? the test, your test, your test, your test, all the way down? The answer is no. Um, 
when I say make sure everything is tested, I mean your app code. Now, all of Fastlane tooling has extensive tests around it itself, so you have some degree of confidence that that tooling behaves the way it should. Again, the CI service provided by BuildKite, the guys test it really, really well. So you know that that is in fact tested. So even though you're not testing, say, your fast file explicitly in a unit tested fashion, you are you do have some degree of confidence that Fastlane itself is tested and your CI server is tested as well. I'll probably just add, don't wait until you just about ready to submit yeah. to run your app store. Like one step for the first time. Yeah. yeah. yeah as I said, I think the best way to make sure that your pipeline works to run every time. Yep. So like maybe, of course, you can run the pipeline to submit to the app store, but you can run the one for beta test, for test test beta submission. Yep, yep. So some of the further comments were make sure that your deploy to app store is tested before you actually hit your ship date with your deploy to test flight beta. The suggestion was run it every night. I would actually say every merge back to develop could itself be a new test flight beta deployment. Now you will run into headaches around that with Apple's only two releases per day. But everything that goes up to test flight beta doesn't have to have the manual release button hit on it. So you can still specifically do that. Well, Fastlane has uh, Collision, yeah. which can submit to test flight for internal testers automatically and in under time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, down the back. Um, I'm always more comfortable when I can run basically the CI script on any local base machine rather than having it all stuck in Jenkins. So I, I like test flight and I don't like using the Jenkins Xcode plugin, which is horrible. Really bad. But just being able to run it locally. So like if, if locally you can run the tests and get the coverage and everything the same way that the CI servers will, then Yep, yep. So the comment was that by being able to run the majority of your tooling locally on a dev machine, you in fact gain a lot of confidence about your process and your pipeline and everything being at a state where you know it works. And that's, that's something great with Fastlane and BuildKite, completely agree. Okay, so the question was around, um, say you have a team that includes both Android and iOS. Android has a lot of existing tooling and functionality to do it, and Android people have somewhat of a tendency to test really well. And there is some perception that the same uh, doesn't happen in iOS is that to do with uh, philosophy, mindset, or tooling. Historically, the tooling around iOS testing has not been great. And 
we have seen a lot of really, really good improvements. Um, originally, we had something, I think, called uh, Send Test, which was one of the first unit test um, frameworks. Apple then sort of brought that in, um, I think, first as OC test, then XC test. Um, so there's been a progression there. Um, XC test exists as, um, uh, it's not, it, yeah, so that exists by default within Xcode, and that's really good. It's providing us that. Um, Xcode 7 has since brought in UI testing. Um, the slide I had was just UI testing. Um, comment I made was about words I'd said in January about UI testing not being good and to avoid it. I now have to take those back because of what Apple has introduced in Xcode 7. So I would say that historically there hasn't been much of a unit testing or even functional testing mindset in iOS developers, just <laughs> in part because of lack of tooling. That's no longer the case. These days we have some really good tooling that exists and I do highly recommend that people use it. Um, to add to that, um, a lot of the time your CI service also plays into it. So people will commonly go, well, I want one CI service that runs my uh, Android test, that runs my web framework test, that runs my iOS test. And iOS typically gets the short end of that, being Android people will heavily push for Jenkins. I would actually say something like BuildKite is a much lighter weight um, CI service, particularly with the agent, and it can just as easily run Android tests. Um, to be fair to other CI services out there, you've got stuff like Travis CI, Circle CI, and a lot of others, which again do handle all facets really well, your web stuff, your Android stuff, and your iOS stuff. Cool. Another question, right. keep going. So apart from uh, the horrible Jenkins Xcode build plugin and Fastlane, what else is anyone else using to survive? Um, In my experience, it's quite often just been custom scripts. Um, my day job is actually with Outwear Mobile, and we do use a lot of custom scripts. Unfortunately, to my um, frustration, we do also use Jenkins, but I'm hoping that will one day change.